Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sands. Up in just a few, we have the Scandals segment brought to you by Your Home TV and Kathy Ireland Worldwide. Today, we're featuring Imran Ansari of Idala Bertuna Kamins, otherwise known as ABK Law, right here in the heart of New York City. He's also a regular contributor and legal analyst on Law and Crime and Court TV. TV. Today, we're chatting about Alec Baldwin and Sofia Vergara and the lawsuits that surround them. Now, Alec Baldwin facing an involuntary manslaughter charged for the shooting death of arrest cinematographer Hylina Hutchins. And Sofia Vergara is being sued as Griselda Blanco's family seeks to halt the Griselda series that Netflix just started promoting. But clearly, that did not stop them. Now, back to Alec. In a tragic turn of events, Alec Baldwin, a grand jury, has indicted him, and if convicted, he could be looking at up to 18 months in prison. Now, that's not much, one would say, but in terms of career, that's literally career suicide, and that's another conversation. Now, the special prosecutors leading the case argued probable probable cause based on additional facts from their extensive investigation pointing to Baldwin's potential criminal culpability in the incident that claimed Hylina's life and also injured the director, Joel Souza. Now, this fatal incident occurred on the set of the film at the Bonanza Creek Ranch when a prop gun Alec Baldwin held discharged unexpectedly. Now, despite his repeated claims, and I mean repeated claims of not pulling the trigger, the legal aftermath has been really complex. Lawsuits were filed, criminal charges were initially made and then later dropped for him, and various allegations surfaced and then resurfaced. So much to talk about. Welcoming now to the show is my expert at hand, Imran Ansari. Welcome to the show, superstar. Thanks for having me, Zen. Well, I Can you explain the legal basis for, for Alec being charged with involuntary manslaughter in this case? Sure. So this prosecution has had a uh, it's ups and downs. You know, prosecutors brought this case uh, originally had an indictment. And uh, there's also been a change of prosecutors uh, due to some conflicts of interest. But now they come forward, Zen, uh, with another indictment uh, reached by a grand jury with these counts of involuntary manslaughter. And to answer your question, they are based on allegations that uh, that gun was in Alec Baldwin's hand. The trigger was pulled. Uh, and the gun went off. And of course, there's that tragedy with Helena Hutchins, uh, and she has been uh, essentially uh, killed due to that gun. So they're connecting the dots here, connecting the dots from the shooting to Alec Baldwin. How are they doing that? Uh, well, they had this gun tested uh, by expert forensic analysis and ballistics analysis, and they came to the conclusion that, that the trigger uh, was pulled. Now, Alec Baldwin has long stated that he did not pull the triggers in, but now they have this test in hand, uh, which shows that there had to be at least two pounds exerted on that trigger uh, in, of pressure in order for that gun to go off. And that's what they presented to this grand jury again. And the grand jury did indict Alec Baldwin for involuntary manslaughter. Of course, Alec Baldwin appearing in court and entering a plea of not guilty. But how significant is the grand jury indictment in, in this case? And what potential legal consequences does he face if convicted? We know that it's not like he set out to murder her, but to your point, he did pull the trigger. So what does this all mean for him? Like you said, it could be career suicide in terms of uh, a, uh, a conviction or a plea of guilty uh, in this case that could have ramifications, of course, for Alec Baldwin uh, in the movie industry. But what does it mean legally? What does he face if he is convicted? Well, upwards of 18 months in prison, Zen. And, uh, you know, listen, any a day in prison, a night in prison is a long time. Prison is not a pleasant place to be, especially if you are a Hollywood star who uh, is used to million dollar mansions in the Hamptons yeah. or uh, out West in LA or what have you, or New York penthouses, it's not going to be a pleasant place. Ain't uh, looking so good for, ain't looking good for Alec. And, and also the film's assistant director, David Halls. And I think this is significant who handed Baldwin the gun reached a plea deal for negligent use of a deadly weapon resulting in a suspended sentence and six months of probation. So that is already setting precedence. And then, you know, among them, the film's armor. And this is 
the craziest part. Hannah Gutierrez Reed, she faced charges of involuntary manslaughter and ev evidence tampering. She pleaded not guilty with her trial scheduled for, for this month. But eventually, the what is mind-boggling to me is that this film resumed in Montana and concluded production. They went on to, you know, button up the film. But the legal right. saga that's unfolding and the film industries, the way that the film industry is grappling with the repercussions of a tragic onset incident has really left such a lasting impact. And my question to you is, given Baldwin's claims of not pulling the trigger, how might his defense team approach the case? And, and, and I mean, what challenges are they going to really encounter? Because, I mean, how do you how do you get cleared of this? Yes. Yeah, and so, uh, of course, these are all allegations. Right. And there's a presumption of innocence uh, and a defendant is innocent until proven guilty by the prosecution. It's going to be the prosecution's burden uh, to prove Alec Baldwin's guilt and they're going to do that with the evidence at hand. You asked about the defense now. The defense does have a potential to do away with this case. And let me tell you why. The gun that was tested, the gun that was used by Alec Baldwin on set, what went off, of course, uh, unintentionally and led to this tragedy, was tested again in order to present evidence to the grand jury and get this indictment. Why is that problematic? This gun was damaged, and I believe it was damaged while it was uh, in evidence collection by the FBI, and they had to reconstruct certain parts of this gun in order to test it uh, and get the evidence which allowed for this indictment. The defense team here is going to attack that testing. Uh, it's not the original gun in its complete form. They had to add parts and recreate certain aspects or dynamics or mechanisms in that gun. And that's going to allow the defense to say, listen, you got this indictment by saying Alec Baldwin had to exert at least two pounds of pressure on that trigger. Alec Baldwin's defense is that I didn't pull the trigger. And you're relying on test results from a gun that's not in its original form. Who's to say that the parts that were put in there were somehow flawed or or, or created a uh, different sort of mechanism uh, than the original gun? Right. So that's going to be one ability for the defense uh, to attack this case. But what's interesting, Zen, we talked about uh, Alec Baldwin going on to complete the film Rust uh, and in, in honor of Helena Hutchins. But one order from the judge uh, when he came before the judge on this indictment, entered a plea of not guilty, was that he could not do this behind the scenes uh, of Rust piece that he was planning on doing. The judge actually instructed him that he is not to do that. So you're seeing the ramifications from the courtroom and the legal aspect into the actual production and on set. Wow, this is so complicated, but this was such fabulous insight. I love having you on. He definitely should hire you as his as his lawyer because <laughs> because that's what you do and that's why you do it best. Now, let's move on to Sofia Vergara. We have about six minutes left. So Sofia sure. Vergara, she's being sued um, as Griselda Blanco's family was seeking to halt the Netflix show. Now, they didn't succeed because it's out on Netflix, all six episodes. But it, it when you look at the legal action from the family of Griselda Blanco, the infamous Colombian drug lord, right, over the mini miniseries, for those of you that are not familiar, titled Griselda, the family representing Blanco's estate filed a lawsuit against Sofia Vergara and Netflix alleging unauthorized use of their family's image and likeness. Now, Imran, what legal grounds do Griselda Blanco's family have for suing Sofia Vergara and Netflix, not just one, but both over this miniseries? Well, if they are able to establish, right, and it's mainly uh, the son, uh, which is uh, his name is Michael Corleone Blanco, uh, who is alleging that he was meeting with Netflix people. He had copious amounts of notes, information, uh, in order to uh, document his mother's life, uh, document some of the things that occurred. And he is alleging that that material, those stories, that content made its way into this Netflix production. Uh, and that's why 
Uh, he's saying that Netflix should be liable to him uh, in order uh, to, you know, pr providing compensation. He said he wasn't compensated. He said the material uh, and, and certain aspects that he knew and no one else did. So he's saying there's no other source for this information but himself. Um, he should have been given some credit, basically, to put it in the most simplest terms. Uh, but he didn't get that. Uh, and that's why he's going to court now. He's saying that, uh, you know, this information was misappropriated. It wasn't given the proper credit. He wasn't compensated for it. Uh, and you got to think that Michael Corleone Blanco may have had his own aspirations to get his mother's story to uh, the screen. And, and that's why he was meeting with producers, directors, right. et cetera. Uh, and now he's saying he wasn't given that opportunity. He wasn't given that sort of maybe, maybe creative control he wanted or just control over that information. Um, and that's why he's suing. Of course, Netflix and uh, the uh, uh, individuals behind this production, including Sofia Vergara, uh, are likely going to say no. That's not the case. There's it's going public to be knowledge. Certain... They're going to yeah. argue that 90% of the miniseries was based on public knowledge. I watched it. Um, and and yes, I do agree. This happens all the time in Hollywood. I, I know because my husband is the CEO of Romulus Entertainment and we see this happen time and time again. But to your point, the son now the, the only surviving son is claiming that he provided interviews specifically for yeah. a potential production of his family's story and i guess he may have provided interviews to directly to netflix at some point right. in time and now he's accusing netflix of incorporating like you said these specific materials into the show without proper compensation and i think that any judge would look at that and misuse of likeness is is a real thing in hollywood so the lawsuit Absolutely. the lawsuit yeah. was seeking to block the release of the series which which got released january 25th and uh the the blanco children urgently pursuing a court injunction now in cases involving unauthorized yeah. use of likeness how do courts typically assess claims and determine compensation well you get, they're going to take a step back right and they're going to look at the the background behind uh the contact between the individual who is saying that likeness was used or their materials misappropriated into a production or a film TV show, what have you, without proper compensation or without permission. Uh, and they're going to look at the interactions between the parties that led up to this. Was there a writing, a contract of some sorts uh, that was in play? Was there an agreement, in at least in principle, that seems to have been uh, disregarded? Uh, and they're going to look at things like that. I know that the defense uh, uh, for Netflix and the production um, are sort of making this into a copyright case. Uh, and and if it's a copyright case, that brings it to a whole other level. It's going to be uh, looking at federal copyright law. Uh, and I think this action, I believe this action was brought in state court in Florida. Now the lawyers for Netflix are looking to bring it to federal court, saying it's a copyright case. There's going to be a lot of moving parts here, but it's going to be up to the plaintiff, right, Mark, Michael Corleone Blanco and the family, to really prove that there was this information, that they were the exclusive holders of this information. It wasn't public knowledge, right? Because if it's a public figure, uh, then you have less control over the likeness, the story, the content. And if a court determines that uh, Blanco, because although Blanco was a public figure, her story was out there, then it's going to be more difficult for Michael Corleone Blanco and the family to prove their case that it was an exclusive uh, realm of knowledge, information that was misappropriated by Netflix without compensation or permission. Um, so I think that's how the case is going to play out here. And, and, and really that interaction, which is going to be gleaned most likely through discovery, if Netflix isn't successful on a motion to dismiss or things like that, um, are really going to be telling to see if there was uh, an intent to compensate the, the Blanco family, an intent to include them in the production, uh, and that they were looking for that, and that Netflix disregarded that. That's going to be the real key question, of course, uh, other sort of specifics under the law. Uh, but that when, when you boil it down to the most simple aspects, that's, that's going to be the issue. Amazing insight, always. I, I, I hope that they have paper trail. I hope that they have email. I hope that they have correspondence, uh, you know, giving this information to Netflix or some kind of ability to prove to your point that this is not something that could have been pulled off the internet, researched, Googled. Um, and that's really going to be the determining factor here. So it's important to cross all your T's, dot all your I's, especially with when it comes to making making a movie and giving information, proprietary information, um, to those producers. 
Thank you so much for coming on, Imran. It's always so insightful having you. And, and of course, I know that we're going to talk about Young Thug next week. So brace yourselves because Imran has all the latest scoop. Thanks for having me, Zen. Yeah. In the midst of this legal battle, Sophia is doing major press discussing her transformative role as the cocaine godmother. No easy feat, let me tell you, portraying Griselda. That was a very complex figure driven by a fierce commitment to protect her family. That encompasses a ton of range of emotions. That was our scandal segment brought to you by Your Home TV and their channel partners, Kathy Ireland Worldwide. That was the incredible Imran Ansari, partner at Idala Bertuna Kamins, and he's also a regular contributor and legal analyst on Law and Crime and Court TV. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this.